and welcome everyone to the third video in our unit on linear algebra. In this video, we'll be generalizing how to measure distances in Euclidean space by looking at inner products and norms. Then we'll explore what orthogonality means for sets of vectors in vector spaces, and then for matrices. Along the way, we'll discover some algorithms for creating orthogonal sets and orthogonal matrices. Inner products are the generalization of the Euclidean dot product to vector spaces. An inner product space is a vector space with a binary operation denoted v, w in brackets called an inner product that must satisfy three conditions. The first is linearity. The inner product of a times v with w is equal to a times the inner product of v with w. The inner product is also distributive over vector addition. So the inner product of u plus v with w is equal to the inner product of u with w plus the inner product of v with w. The second property is symmetry. The inner product of v with w is equal to the inner product of w with v. The third property is positivity. The inner product of v with itself is always greater than zero, unless v is the zero vector, in which case it is zero. Inner product spaces have a norm associated to their inner product, denoted by the magnitude of v, which is the square root of the inner product of v with itself. The Euclidean dot product is an example of an inner product. Here, we're looking at the dot product of v1 with v2. This gives us 2 times 2 plus 1 times 0 is equal to 4. Orthogonality is another consequence of the inner product. Two elements of an inner product space are called orthogonal if their inner product is 0. For example, using the dot product again, the inner product of v2 and v3 is 0, so they are orthogonal. We can also use the inner product to define a unit vector equal to v divided by the magnitude of v. This new vector is parallel to v and has a norm equal to 1. For example, we can divide v1 by its magnitude, the square root of 5, to get a unit vector parallel to v1. We define one type of norm, the magnitude of v, but norms too can be generalized. A norm on a vector space assigns a real number, confusingly also denoted as the magnitude of v, to every vector in the vector space subject to three properties. Firstly, positivity. The norm of v is always greater than or equal to zero, and it's only equal to zero when v is the zero vector. Secondly, homogeneity. The norm of a scalar a times a vector v is equal to the absolute value of a times the norm of v. And thirdly, the triangle inequality, where the norm of v plus w is less than or equal to the norm of v plus the norm of w. Every inner product can be used as a way to measure distances on a vector space. However, many norms that are useful don't come from inner products. For example, the LP norm. The LP norm of v is equal to the pth root of the sum on i of the ith element of v to the pth power. Three interesting LP norms are the Euclidean norm, or the L2 norm, which is the familiar magnitude of a vector in Euclidean space. For example, this vector has length equal to the square root of 5. The taxicab or Manhattan norm is the L1 norm. It measures distances when you're restricted to move only left and right or up and down. It's equal to the sum of the absolute value of the components of V. Our vector has taxi cab norm equal to 3. The last is the L infinity norm, which is the maximum of the set of the absolute values of the components of V. Our vector has L infinity norm of 2. Each norm has a unit sphere defined for it which is the set of all vectors that have norm equal to one. Our Euclidean norm has a unit sphere that is just the unit circle. Any pair whose absolute values add to one forms the unit sphere for the L1 norm. This looks like a diamond with coordinates one, zero, zero, one, minus one, zero, and zero, minus one. The unit sphere for the L infinity norm also looks a bit curious. It is a square of side length 2 centered at the origin. See if you can convince yourself why this makes sense. Now that we have understood the concepts of inner product and orthogonality, we can use them to understand properties of vectors in vector spaces and subspaces. One very useful concept is that of a basis. 
The set S of vectors in the vector space V is called a basis of V if the elements of S are linearly independent and every vector in V can be written as a linear combination of elements in S. Thus, every basis is a linearly independent spanning set. N-dimensional vector spaces have bases consisting of N linearly independent vectors. Every vector space that we know of has a basis. However, the proof of this relies on Zorn's lemma, or the axiom of choice. Conversely, if every vector space can be proven to have a basis, then the axiom of choice is true. So assuming that the axiom of choice is true, a basis B of an n-dimensional inner product space V is called orthogonal if the inner product of any pair of vectors in B is equal to zero. Let's look at this example of an orthogonal basis for R3. V1 is equal to 1, 1, minus 1. V2 is equal to minus 1, 2, 1. And V3 is equal to 3, 0, 3. We can easily check that it is an orthogonal basis. Given an orthogonal basis, any vector can be written as a linear combination of its elements, where the coefficient of the ith vector is given by the inner product of x with vi divided by the magnitude of vi squared. You can think of the inner product as projecting the vector x onto the vector vi. For example, we can write x equals 1 minus 3, 1 as a linear combination of our basis vectors v1 through v3. The component of x that's parallel to v1 is minus 1 minus 1, 1. The component of x that's parallel to v2 is 1 minus 2, 1, and parallel to v3 is 1, 0, 1. When we add those vectors together, we recover our original vector x. Additionally, we call an orthogonal basis orthonormal if the magnitude of each of its elements is equal to 1. We can get this by dividing any vector by its magnitude. Next, we'll have a look at the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. This is an algorithm that creates an orthonormal basis for a vector space or subspace. Imagine we start with a linearly independent set of vectors v1 through vk in an n-dimensional inner product space. The Gram-Schmidt process generates a new set of k orthonormal vectors that spans the same subspace as the original set. This takes advantage of the same projection operator we just used to decompose vectors into components of an orthogonal basis. The projection of v onto u is given by the inner product of u with v divided by the inner product of u with itself. The Gram-Schmidt algorithm is as follows. Pick one vector from the original basis to be the first element of the orthogonal basis and call it u1. Next, we define u2 as v2 minus the projection of v2 on u1. Basically, we're finding the component of v2 that is parallel to u1 and subtracting it from v2. Then the next vector in our orthogonal basis, u3, is equal to v3 minus the projection of v3 onto u1 minus the projection of v3 onto u2. And we repeat this process until we get to the kth vector, uk, is equal to vk minus the sum on i from i equals 1 to k of the projection of vk onto the new orthogonal basis vector ui. Then we divide each of the vectors in our orthogonal basis by its magnitude to get an orthonormal basis for our vector space. In addition to sets of vectors being orthogonal, there is a notion of matrix orthogonality too. An orthogonal matrix is a square matrix whose rows and columns are orthonormal vectors. This can be written as Q transpose Q is equal to Q, Q transpose is equal to the identity. Or equivalently, Q transpose is equal to Q inverse. Orthogonal matrices are a special kind of linear transformation called a unitary transformation. Unitary transformations are transformations that preserve the inner product. Here are a few examples of orthogonal 2x2 two two matrices and the effect of their linear transformation on this set of shapes. First is the identity. This, of course, leaves the shapes unchanged. Secondly, we have a rotation matrix. 
which rotates our objects about the origin by some angle, theta. And lastly, we have a reflection matrix, which reflects our shapes about the x-axis. We've been thinking about systems of linear equations and solving them using matrices. In the first video in this series, we used Gauss-Jordan elimination to solve systems of equations. However, there are several matrix decompositions that give us more information about a system. One of those is the QR decomposition. The QR decomposition is the decomposition of any square matrix A into the product of an orthogonal matrix Q and an upper triangular matrix R. You can think of this as a unitary operation on a particular basis for A. One algorithm for QR decomposition uses the Gram-Schmidt process using the basis of column vectors for A. We can write Q as a matrix of unit vectors coming from the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of A. The upper right triangular matrix R is then a matrix of projections of the components of the columns of A onto the basis vectors of Q. We will return to this technique in the next video where we explore data fitting and linear regression. Mm -hmm.